I'm known as Czar Aldo Sanchez. Was born in Guatemala City, uh, grew up in Patterson, New Jersey. I'm a graffiti artist slash uh, muralist. Well, I started uh, writing graffiti in 82, uh, around 82. Business-wise, uh, maybe like around 85, 86, started dabbling in it, and then complete official business in 2010, 2011. I was like about uh, in my early teens, you know, 11, 12 years old, I started noticing it when I didn't really have a interest in any sports or anything like that. So I uh, started noticing tags around the city when I was walking to school. A couple of my friends and I noticed the tags and were interested, you know, were uh, intrigued and a lot of us wanted to do it. So we all got together, formed a little group, and we all started practicing and doing our thing. It took us about a year to lose the fear and go onto the streets and, and start figuring out how to do it, you know, on the streets rather than just on paper and on, with markers. So it was, an, it was an interesting adventure to start. I had not an artistic bone in my body. I, I didn't even know, even stick figures came out bad. So, uh, you know, it was just a lot of uh, trial and error and practice and practice and practice learn from watching other guys or watching other people's work and trying to figure it out. I didn't have art training into uh, high school and that was just basically, you know, my art teacher taught, taught me a little of shading and stuff like that and I took it from there and added it to my elements and that's how I started getting better in, my, in, in art rather than just graffiti. And, but that's where it took off like that in high school. I went to one of the worst schools in, this, in the country, uh, Eastside High School. So that was a challenge within itself, but again, my graph, having, not, uh, having pe people know who I am, helped me not get into problems and help people, you know, ease me in. So help, it's been helping me out ever since, but yeah, uh, by the time I got out of high school, I was already czar. I started Eastside High School the year before Joe Clark got there. By the time Joe Clark got there, you know, and all the movie situation got started, they already had cleaned up all of our school. So uh, the film companies came from L.A. and from Hollywood and they took over the field with, you know, trailers. And it was crazy. It was cool to see it, you know, I mean, 80-something, you know, to see an actual film being made about your school. So, uh, you know, at the beginning, we were all on, on board. We were all cool with it. But then um, they started bringing in actual artists to duplicate our tags and our graffiti. So we got upset. We asked that we can just duplicate our own artwork so we could be authentic and they wouldn't allow us. So we boycotted and didn't participate in the movie. And now I regret it, but I had to stand my ground. But yeah, yeah I was there for the filming of Lean On Me, the movie for, about Isa High School. I used to, I started off as Wiz, W-I-Z, uh, because um, I used to dabble with DJing. And I used to call myself DJ Wizard. It was too long and whiz, there was too many whizzes in Patterson, so cut it down to Czar and that's how Czar was born. I guess I started doing Czar like in 84, maybe, 84 or something like that. Well, Patterson is the third largest city in New Jersey, uh, one of the highest crime cities, unfortunately. But, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of history in Patterson. Lou Costello from Abbott and Costello, famous boxers, a couple of famous baseball stars and even football players came out of there, you know, so. But with the graffiti, yeah, we, we've been, it's, it's probably had it since like the mid 70s to late 70s. At one point there was over, I wouldn't say easy, over 300 riders in Patterson or 400 or more. It was just, uh, of course, mostly tags and throw-ups and stuff like that, but you, you, do, you did have your actual burners here and there, a couple murals here and there, uh, you know, but it was mostly uh, bombed up, basically. It got to the point that they couldn't control it. Uh, they would paint walls and erase stuff, and <laughs> that same night, people were you know, writing on it. So uh, it got to the point that they, uh, they uh, tried to find a, a solution to try to, you know, clean up the city they noticed that people weren't scared of the law or whatever so they sought out a gentleman that uh that worked with a company called inner city ensemble this is an organization that's in patterson that uh, i think is still around and they keep children out of kids basically out of the streets teach them theater teach them dancing teach them art if anything i think we're the ones that started the art there and uh it was ran by a gentleman named uh, ralph gomez and uh, he had the illusion to do something similar with the graffiti so he approached the city or i'm not sure details as to who approached who, but he represented the 
city and he got all of us together from the leading local groups. Myself was with, you know, head of TGF. We were a part of CPW, which were uh, ran by SCAT. Then Mitch had TMD, Toys Must Die, and uh, Soap had Crazy King. So all those crews came together. A lot of the writers looked up to us and, uh, you know, uh, we had already been established as solid writers. So we signed a treaty to uh, not write no more in the city and uh, clean up some of the walls and provide murals and provide uh, uh, conversations with a lot of younger artists, bringing in uh, other artists to uh, get them off the streets. And, you know, television came down, Channel 9, Channel 2, a lot of newspapers. We came out in articles. You know, it was, uh, it was pretty impressive, and that's how we got a feel for the business. Uh, they uh, got us a gig doing art shows in all the major malls, Willowbrook Mall, Newport Mall, Paramus, and I think Rockaway. You know, so we were teenagers selling canvases, you know, hundreds of dollars. So that woke up that business part the business bug in most of us. And most of us dabbled and continue doing it as a business like I'm doing it myself now. Structurally wise, from what we could see, and I mean, by the time I got to see trains and I got to see all that was when they were already the nice ones, not the ugly beginning ones in the 70s. Not that they were ugly, but again, you know, as you go, time goes on, we learn how to use our paint we learned how to manipulate it, we learned how to do it better. So you see the progress from the 70s to the 80s to the early 90s when there was still a little bit of trains. And even now, once in a while, somebody uh, sneaks in a train here and there in, my in New York, it's good to see. Once we knew there was art there, a graph there, we knew that that's where we were getting the influence for sure. You know? And then later on we found out in Newark and Jersey City and other cities in New Jersey and Philadelphia. But, you know, there was no internet, no magazines, no books, so it wouldn't come out in the news, God forbid. So we thought we were the only city that, that was doing it, you know. And then as we would go on, you know, little by little, I would see it in other cities and perhaps sake. And again, besides New York, that was always, but I'm saying in New Jersey, it was Patterson, from what I know, from what I hear now, it was Patterson, Newark, and Jersey City the most and then from that, we all spread in throughout the whole state. Until the movies started coming out, Wild Style and uh, Breakdance, Breaking and Wild, uh, Star Wars, all those shows came out and movies and stuff like that, documentaries. Then we started seeing more detail of what was in New York, like Star Wars, you know. That was like finding the Bible and reading it. And now we know the history of where what you do comes from and kind of made more sense. It gave us more security because then we see that other writers had that same passion, the same commitment to it. You know, without even knowing, we all related in the same way. We all have that had had and have that passion to see our art everywhere and to to you know to survive of it and to make something of it. So it was cool once once that came out, it solidified it. You know, and then again, then we knew it was California had its shit. I would have never thought. You know, and so yeah, influences. Uh, were many, you know, maybe two, uh, 10, 20. Again, it was the beginning, you know. There was a guys named Dust and Wreck and uh, uh, OJ-167, Top 007, uh, Dondi from Patterson, New Jersey, uh, Cole, Min, even that guy Mitch. He was up a lot. He did a lot, you know. So whatever happened in the later part of the history, that there was an issue with him in New York, but... To us, those were the icons. Those were the people that we looked up to because they were all over the place. So we wanted to be them. You know, I would see all of the tags everywhere, throw us pieces. It was amazing, you know. So to us, those were the teachers to us, you know. And these guys were rocking stuff in late 70s, early 80s. By the time I started, they were already so solid graph artists or even kings, if you want to call it. They had their styles down, they were all over the place. Scott, you know, he started at an early age from like grammar school with some of these guys. So, and later on in life, me and him ended up com connecting and becoming partners and doing a lot of uh, work in New York and New Jersey together. So that was an accomplishment, uh, uh, an honor, uh, you know, it was cool. You know, I used to grow up seeing his tags, wanting to be like him, f met him, and then ended up being re real close friends. So. It was cool. I had many partners that, that I had my little year or two that we did our 
wrecking together, you know, Scott being one of them, Snow being one of them. I, I did a lot of stuff with Snow. We both kind of started at the same time and both helped each other create our styles and become who we started to be or who we became, you know. Tech, another brother from Passaic that has done a lot of work in Patterson, Settle. I, I mean, I can go on and on, but those are the guys that were really meant to uh, do. He was a, a big inspiration for me. I, I met him when I went into high school. He was, again, king in, in my eyes, you know I mean? Rocked black books, rocked jackets, rocked everything. And then he's the one that helped me develop my style and develop my technique. Again, I wasn't an artist. I didn't, I had to really work hard to get to the point that I'm at now. So the first step is just getting a sketch up uh, to get an idea of what's going up, where and all that. So right now I'm just shaping up your camera because I'm going to draw the camera. Just getting the feel of the size of it. I don't like to prepare too much because you got to improvise a lot of times like today, you know, I didn't know where I was going to paint. So when you don't know where you're painting, it's rough to plan or to calculate like how much paint you're going to use and all that good stuff because it's, uh, you know, you don't know where you're, and unless I had a certain place that I can paint all the time, then it's, you know, be a lot easier. So, all right, so I can, I could show you what a tag is, which is what I have on my shirt, but, you know, I'll yeah, just show you, that, that would be a tag, all right? And then, you know, basically you have to have a, a tag and at least a throw up to uh, identify yourself and, you know, to get up and, I don't do much anymore, so it's a little wobbly. That will be a throw up. You know, bu bubble letter. Sometimes it could be a square, you know, a square like that. A bubble letter czar will be like this. Oof. Haven't done one in a while, so. But just so you see what a bubble letter is, will be that. Something like, in my style. And then, you know, then you have, of course, your block letters and piecing letters. So this will be considered block letters, you know, of course, with a little style to them. And then this will be more of a wild stylish, fancy style. I don't consider that a wild style. To me, a wild style is something you can't read. But now, in the, in nowadays, as long as it has a few arrows and has a little bit of a zigzag, they consider it a wild style. So I'll go along with the times and call it a, a wild style. But... Yeah, wild stuff will be something that you can't even read. Basically like what you have behind here. This is a wild stuff. So while well, we do our name, you know, with just colors and all that, that's a piece, uh, a burner, if you call it. You know, sometimes we do color the background to cover whatever is under, underneath it, but otherwise that's just a burner piece. And now I'm just sketching it, shaping it, especially since I don't have an actual sketch to go by, I'm bringing it out of my head. So as I go along, I shape it up so now you know again since i'm just shaping it up i gotta figure out what colors to put in it yeah now i'm filling in the letters so, so i can start seeing what's here but nowadays everybody as soon as they see artwork whether it's graffiti or not they call it a mural you know and i'm fine with it but in reality a mural is something that tells more of a story something that has more than than just a name it will have a you know skyline or a sky and a, a ground or, will be in a tunnel, it'll be telling a story. So that will be more of a, a mural. A production is when a couple of writers get together and do a piecing at the same time. Tag is a tag, it's, a, it's disposable. It's, it's just there to show you were there. If I, I wanna come and do a throw up, a fill-in, basically I can go over a bunch of tags. And if that fill-in is gonna get gone over by a piece, I can't beef about it because again, one covers the other. I'm not gonna let a wall run with a bunch of throw ups when, you know, I can do a piece and make it look a lot better. So that's when the laws come in. A tag rocked by a fill-in, a throw-up. Throw-up gets rocked by a piece. Of course, a piece will get rocked by a production or a mural and so on, you know. But nowadays, of course, everybody's a diva and sometimes they get upset when you went over the throw-ups or their tags. And I understand. I was there. I, I, I've been there. I, I know it's hard to hit some of these spots and I know it's, it takes balls, you know. But again, if, if we got the chance to do something better, then, you know, so be it, you know, but again, some of the writers nowadays have a, a different mentality about it, you know, and uh, so there's a lot of different mentalities out there now, you know, we got the old school mentality, which is somewhat of mine. 
I call it the mid school, which are the, car the writers that came out in the 90s, and then the new school, which is, you know, 2000s and up, basically learned online and from artists online that don't even know their local history, you know, and it's a shame because instead of looking to local artists for apprenticeness or, or just for showing and guidance, they, they go online and look at these European writers or New York writers. And a lot of these writers now, they're so picky, they, you know, they, they write everything down, what they're going to do. They have to have a clean white slate. They can't do it over somebody else's or a lot of writing, you know, that'll throw them off. You know, so it's a lot of divaness in there, you know, as you're going to see in the video, you know, we came up to this wall, had pieces on it, we rock on top of it, and before you know it, whatever's there disappears. That's a true writer. You're able to walk up to the wall, do your thing, and use whatever's there to your advantage as much as you can. If not, you get creative in how you cover it to the point that it disappears. So it went from one mural to another mural, if you want to call it, or production. posts of pieces or burners or productions even wow so clean when you will walk up out the drips and you know lines all wiggly and you know we look for a lot of that you know when we're judging ourselves you know cleanliness sharpness you know how sharp and how clean and how straight is that line how good is that circle you know i mean that tells the experience when somebody can just do something without having to stop and do it in multiple action you know so all that we look at when we judge, at least myself, when I judge somebody else's, you know, how clean, how sharp, how neat. Some people are just sloppy and you can see it, you know, a lot of splatter, a lot of dustiness. So, you know, that's their style, that's their style. Back in the day, uh, you know, it was just markers that you would have, different size markers, you know, they have pilots that are thick. And then you have your smaller markers for when you want to get into smaller sections. And that's what consists of our gear back in the day, dressed in black. You want to be in and out like a ninja, kind of. You don't want to, you don't want to be seen. You don't want nobody to know what you're doing. You know, book bag, of anything, if you're carrying that much paint. When we used to use our, our paint, it was a Rust-Oleum, Krylon. And they came with these regular nozzles, uh, skinny caps. We would cut them up, put pin needles into them to make them fatter, make them different shapes. But then one day, you know, I myself, I had to clean my mother's oven. And I noticed the can came out a lot thicker. And when I saw it was one of these caps, a lot of us opted out to take the caps at the store and, and from oven cleaners and glass cleaners. And that's how the fat caps came about, you know, thicker, fatter tags. So then the companies got mad and they noticed that. So they changed the cans to a female cap, thinking that they can stop us from using them. Somebody came up with an adapter so we can still use our caps and, and on their cans. And, you know, of course, now the gear is different. Now you have multiple variations of caps skinny caps, fat caps, you know, blending caps and so on. Everything is specialized. They sell them online, you know, so you have a variety of caps that you can use on, on all the different types of paint that they make now, you know. I mean, the, the modern paint is made out of sugar, you know, or, or acrylic, mostly acrylic based. So it's a lot healthier for you, uh, you know, if you don't use a mask or if you're doing indoor painting or just in, in general, you know. I mean, back in the day, the paint was just Krylon, Rustoleum and Red Devil, basically, those were the top three. Now we have hundreds of brands that came out from all over Europe and even the United States, Canada, I think. It's hard to explain. I mean, when we started, again, we all, there was no handbook. There was no online. Right now you could go online and you can 
<laughs> you can YouTube anything you want. We didn't know. We didn't have a handbook. Nobody taught, at least me, nobody walked me through it. This is how you got to do it. So uh, we were pioneers in a way that we, our methods, our techniques, our hits, you know, we would hit places that nobody thought they couldn't get hit or they couldn't, they wouldn't dare hit, you know, so we were setting the, the standards up pretty high. The writers nowadays, again, you could go online and buy everything from paint to caps to probably a wall. It's a game changer, you know, I mean, anybody can pick up a can nowadays and within a couple of days you'll be comfortable enough to, you know, do something decent on the wall if you don't have an artistic bone in you. If you have artistic talent, it's pretty much, you can adapt to it pretty fast. I think the golden age will be when graffiti grew, graffiti changed into a different monster. I mean, in the 90s, the new paint came along, so it was a game changer. You know, paint, uh, murals and paintings and graph, everything in general was looking more solid, more brighter, more cleaner. Incredible crews came out of like New York City, you know, that amazed all of us and inspired all of us, you know, like FX crew and uh, Tats crew and UW crew and FC crew and uh, FBA and IBM, I mean, and so on. These crews are tight. These crews have been painting for years and they used to paint on trains, most of them. That when they would get together and do murals, I mean, a mural, you know, artwork, graffiti, characters, total complete stories, you know, those are murals. Uh, I always wanted to be a cop when I was a kid, you know, I mean, I, I didn't want to go to school, I wasn't a school person, so I, I figured that would have been the path, I, I, always, I always looked up to that. People laughed and thought it was funny because I'm, I'm out there doing graffiti and at the same time I wanted to be who busts me, but, you know, again, you, you, I didn't think it was going to go on forever when I first started, I thought it was just a quick fad, I grew out of it. Then it became more of a passion and more of a, an addiction and more of a, a need to do it. And uh, unfortunate circumstances came along. I, I couldn't pursue being a cop anymore. So uh, I, I you know, ventured into other things in, in, in my life. But pretty much anything and everything that I've done in life, my art has opened the doors or has enhanced my opportunities or have gotten me some amazing you know, jobs that if it wasn't for my art, I wouldn't have had the opportunity, you know. You wanted to avoid having to deal with the law, but there was always runnings with the law. I mean, you're not a writer if you didn't have any kind of runnings, you know, whether getting chased, getting caught and beat up a little here and there or painted or my friend Ajax and I were bombing and a cop caught us in Patterson. It was late. It was almost the end of his shift, so uh, he was pissed off. Ah, now I gotta go, hours of paperwork and all this crap. I gotta call your parents because you're minors. So he was like, unless we take care of this another way, we we're like, well, whatever way is needed, you know, we don't have to call my parents and we don't have to go into the precinct. And he painted all, both of our necks solid, emptied the can out both of our necks. It took a couple of months almost to take the paint out, but that was one of the worst incidents. You know, other time, you know, Hoboken, they painted my hands and the final adventure happened when uh, we got caught in uh, bombing in the uh, highways in New York, like 85, 86. And yeah, we had to pay fines. We had to clean train stations and clean trains because there was still a couple of trains getting bombed up and stuff. Got a little cautious and uh, game changed again, you know, because now you definitely didn't want to get caught. And I stopped basically doing a lot of work in New York. And, uh, you know, business took off more. Life went on. I had a child and so on. So I stopped for a few years. Uh, back in, uh, that was in 88 when my son was born. Then I started again back in 92. It hurt me. Those few years that I stopped hurt my, my advantage, my growth. All my friends that I started with, they took off. The 90s was like the rebirth for graffiti and I, I missed out. I missed, the, I missed the ride. So I wanted to see my name on every sign, every wall, every truck, every everything. It was just, and again, after you see these, uh, shows like Star Wars and you see other writers explaining the same situation, you know, scheme on the trains. I just wanted to see my name on every train and every line. Same thing with me. I wanted to see my name everywhere. My father drove everywhere. I took a bus to everywhere. I was anywhere. I wanted to see my name outside the window. I want to open the door and see my tag. And I got to that point pretty much in Patterson. I mean, I, I really, I really did a lot. And, uh, and then I spread myself, you know, you know I started looking at bus schedule, see what other cities I can go and and I will plan my rides like that, you know, take like a bag full of paint, set aside some for each city and just hit a couple of tags here and there and 
areas that were known or that were famous or were common and that were dangerous. And that's how you know, I got my notoriety in other cities, started hitting all the major highways, started doing a lot of, when the, all the sound barriers went up in the highways, I was one of the first ones to start uh, decorating them. <laughs> it's just the name of the game. Yeah, the, the harder the, the, the hit, the better, the, the location, the higher, the bigger, the more notoriety you get and the more fame. I mean, coming out in the newspaper, coming out in the news, I had rules that I set for myself. I, I wouldn't write on a clean home. I wouldn't write on a church. I wouldn't write on a school or a brand new building, you know, that kind of stuff. I just didn't need to. I, there was so much more for me to write on. Unless it was already written on, unless there was a lot of stuff on it already that one, one more tag didn't hurt. A lot of people wrote on statues and memorials, you know, that's foul. I think you're degrading somebody's art because it is art. And as artists, we should be able to respect other art forms. Once you started doing the business part, the fame part helped. Or the more people knew you, more people knew your work, the more people can say, yeah, he's good or yeah, he's done what he says he's done, or so on. Again, this is before magazines, before even, you know, we couldn't even afford actual pictures, so I, I couldn't take pictures of all my stuff. A lot of things, if it wasn't seen, you wouldn't know. So that was a big point for me to have a lot of my stuff up. And it paid off later on in life. I have given back to a lot of communities. I, I have done donated work. I have done free stuff for, uh, you know, skate parks, for memorials and stuff like that. So there's always gonna be somebody who doesn't agree with what we do, you know. What can I tell you? Uh, you know, they're welcome to their opinion and they're welcome to ask me anything they want to ask me. You know, I'm, it's not, nothing to hide. But again, you're always going to have your people that are always negative about it, that never liked it. My own father didn't like it. So most recent, I guess you want to call it, will be 2010, 2011. My ex-wife, wife at that time, was coming with me to a couple of shows that was, I was being invited to and a couple of events and stuff. And people would come up to me, ask me for my, my tag, my signature. and Start, start telling me stories and interacting with me and she noticed that you know there was a lot of people that knew me and a couple of friends started telling her stories about my past I never really went into telling her detail about Czar itself so she always thought I just dabbled in, in art and that's it you know I never never knew the background how much popularity I had and she was like well you know you might be able to make a business out of this uh, I was a little skeptical, you know, because I was still a little rusty, and, and especially spray painting. And my ex-wife pushed me a lot. She uh, got me on, uh, online. She got me really up to date with a lot of te technical stuff, which helped me blend in more with the, today's writers. And, you know, and that's how I started getting a lot more people following me and uh, a lot more business. I mean, for the first two years, three years, business popped. I started doing hard hats, you know, this, this took off. So like 30 states already, over 200 of them, you know. Uh, everything is a custom, one of a kind. Travel for an organization that I work as well, uh, Artists for Israel. I travel, I started traveling with them for like maybe six, seven, eight years ago, something like that. We go to all the uh, colleges, universities. I do most of the East Coast with my boy Lost, get lost a lot, and Rain from Trenton. It's pretty cool. It's a, it's, it's, it's a great honor to be able to, you know, get paid and, you know, be flown around and have hotels and everything at your disposal. You know, you feel, you know, it feels good to be uh, rewarded for your talent, you know, and we get to interact with other writers in other cities, other countries, other states. First, you got to know your value. You got to know how much you're worth. You gotta know how much your time is worth. How to price the amount of paint that you're gonna use. So you you gotta you don't have calculators. You know there's no set amount of how many feet a spray can covers. First, second, sometimes you only use a little mist of one color just to en en enhance a little part of a piece. So I have to consider the whole can when I'm only gonna use maybe a, you know like I said a quarter of a third of it. So what I usually do is depending on the size the amount of detail in it and the amount of effort that I got to put on it. Do I have to go on ladders? Do I have to go on scaffolding? Do I have to hang over the side of a building? Uh, is there traffic passing behind me? Otherwise, again, size, amount of detail. And I also take the person or, or business into consideration. Uh, if it's a big, large business and they have a big budget. Now, if I have a local business owner or a mama or papa that comes, wants to do something for their child or somebody passes away and they want to do a memorial, 
you know, I most likely just charge for the paint and you know something just for a little for my time. But I, I try to give myself a certain rate an hour, so that way I know I'm comfortable with what I'm making, and they know ahead of time how much they're gonna pay for my art. But uh, detail and size takes a lot into consideration. You know, do they give me already the artwork? Then it's easy for me. I just have to duplicate it. Do I have to create something? Then, you know, then I have to charge you for an hour or two or more of actual sitting down with a pen and paper and creating it. People don't realize that, you know, or, or I have to get a deposit from you. So that locks that down so I don't lose that time. Because again, this is my bread and butter now. So the time that I have to sit down to sketch and create something, it's time that I lose. So that's why I like to do a lot of things off the fly, off the head. I pick a couple colors when I get there, I decide and make the magic happen. Unless it's a job that they want specifics, but if they tell me to give me free reign and they tell me you do what you can do and what you know how to do, that's the ones I love because they're confident about my work, then I'm confident about what I'm gonna put up and it always comes out dope. Getting these customers and getting them to keep coming back. I have many customers like that with my hard hats some customers with mural work, a lot of gyms that keep calling me back, pure uh, energy, you know, they're great with me. Uh, they're always calling me back. I've done a lot of great work with them. Hackensack Brewery, my boy's there. I've done a little bit of work there, I keep adding more. So it's a, it's a great feeling to have places from where I grew that, you know, honor my work and, and, and look up to it. So I would love to do backdrops like in theaters or in plays, that kind of stuff once the world goes into some kind of normalcy. I think I want to move out of New Jersey. I'm done with the cold weather. I think I'm due for a new start, new clientele, new beginning. Uh, I'm looking to go to Israel with Artists for Israel. Uh, hopefully next year if flying and everything gets back to normal. And you know, it's, it's a, a non-profit, so it, we're giving back. So again, that's the, my way of giving back for all the bad things or the bad graffiti that I've done in my past. I like to give back to communities, to kids. I do a lot of workshops, graffiti workshops with kids. We do t-shirts, we do small murals for them. They get to interact with us. We teach them how to paint, explain to them where we come from. And, and it's a great experience.